good surmise based on a whole bunch of circumstantial evidence is we as them and they as us. And at the end of the inhabitable epoch of this amazing planet, as the environment was deteriorating more and more and more, and the glass domes could not keep civilization alive, like that group of Martians in the H.G. Wells tale, looking with envious eyes across the darkness to the blue-green planet Earth, our great, 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 great ancestors were forced to come here. And that's a whole other story. So back to Mars. Uh, Ruggiero, I'm, I want to bring you in now, and I mispronounced your name. It's Kalo. You know, there are times when in the middle of uh, improvising, you uh, don't get everything right. So do you have some thoughts on any of the stuff that we've been talking about so far? And if not, what would you like to uh, regale us with tonight? Uh, I sure do. Firstly, uh, I'm interested in your, your image number eight uh, with the flight. Okay. And um, what's really uh, cool about it is the you've got the dome features in the background again, uh, which we're seeing consistently on on all the um, the, the features from uh, pictures from Jezero. So uh, it lines up with the drawings that Tim has done on, on previous shows. Um, but I, I wanted to go on to my items if we're able to click on to them. Yeah, by all means. So let me just get to my own page. Okay, let me let me um, tell folks how to get there. Go to the other side of midnight.com. Uh, click on tonight's banner, the ancient crystal cities of Barsoom. That will take you to the guest page where you will find at the top another banner. And underneath you'll see guest, the fast link. Click on Ruggiero. It's at the end of the line there. Are you Euro that takes you directly to your items. What do you want to show us? I want to show us the uh, stunning Vernal Memorial Gardens, which is from Keith Laney's Gigapan. So I spent quite a lot of time working on this feature, and um, the it's got this intriguing lineup of um, quite symmetrical mounts. They remind me of the earth mounds we see in uh, my hometown of Dorset. So Tim Saunders would be quite familiar with that. Uh, so this would be 1A, B, and C? Uh, that's right, yeah. Okay, so these are stills taken from uh, Lanyard Gigapan, which is number one. Yeah, and if you, if anyone wants to actually jump on to uh, Keith Laney's Gigapan, which I advise they do, they can do their own measure. It's got two features. It's got one which is a, a length measure and the other an area measure. Of, um, so you can get your, your readings of each amount in that way. Unfortunately, you can't get to a 3D. Now, uh, tell me this. Why is this called the Vernal Memorial Garden? It's certainly not in Yezero. It's somewhere else on Mars. But did, did uh, Keith name this? I think that would be Keith that's, that, that's named that, so I'll have to do some more research. Do we on. know why? I don't. I don't. Um, with that, Andrew, you you also made a... We had a discussion about this before. Have you got any idea why you might have named this? Vernal Memorial Gardens? No, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, we have our speculation what it is, but we, hmm. I don't know. I actually don't know um, hmm. for sure what... Well, Keith, if you're listening, call in and you can tell us why you called. I have no idea what Vernal Memorial Gardens um, means. Uh, I, I, I'm really clueless. I am completely up in the air. I, I can't imagine the association. Memorial and gardens are kind of the... Anyway, be that as it may, let's, let's go to number 1A, because what you're obviously singling out, Ruggiero, is a striking, extraordinary... Uh, array of features that are fairly big but they're organized on another part of Mars uh, without Keith I don't know where we're, where we're looking but obviously this is from MRO imagery or maybe it's uh, Malin's context imager on the MRO spacecraft but these things are 
very, very, very British. They they are. They remind me of our, our hill mounds at home. So I was driving across um, West Dorset. Have you been there when you've been on your travels to the UK? Yes, briefly. So if you ever come over, I'd love to get you in a car and drive you to all my favourite spots so you can actually take in the, the magnificence of our, of our our homeland that looks like it's almost been sculpted out the ground. Well, remember, when we looked at Avebury many, many years ago, we discovered that Avebury seems to be a replication at scale to the eastern, um, yeah, the eastern end of Sidonia, the Crater Cliff region. Yeah, it, it looks exact. I've studied that. Um, there's another image which uh, we've got a whole show on this when um, I sent a Kinfia uh, image of Maiden Castle. Do you remember that? Oh See? yes, yes. <laughs> which is quite symbolic of the uh, the, the man's anatomy. Um, and Kinfia sent me black, back a black and white of the same image feature on Mars, which I found totally compelling. So this this whole landscape kind of reminds me in a, in a way of potential earthworks that uh, have also been um, that, sorry the earthworks have been harnessed around the natural formations of, of the land itself so when we come back just a bit to the science of what I'm seeing when I spoke to Holgar uh, a few weeks back he thinks that the formations could have been caused by a, like a plasma plasma strike onto the surface Mars, but when I look at, I'm not, and I'm not discounting that nature can't create like crystalline structures because it does. We see it all over the Dorset in the rocks. You know, they, they can look quite man-made, even though they're not. So I'm talking about single rock formations or geome the geological lines that we see within the Jurassic Coast. But what I'm seeing here is quite uh, precise um, measurements: a between each feature, and b with the length of each feature. And then we're seeing um, prism, prismatic form uh, within feature to feature, which I've highlighted along each line. But um, so what initially jumped out at me at this Vernon Memorial Gardens is the fact that it looked like it was kind of telling a story in, in mathematics and line. And Andrew made a, made a beautiful point. Um, that he thinks that it's got some kind of a harmonic. And I thought, I thought it looked like the original um, sort of polyphonic uh, grids that make the first uh, recorded sound. Hmm. Does, that, does that make sense? Did you yes, yes, of course. And remember, we're dealing with a physics which mm. is totally about harmony. Mm. You know, the old, the old uh, cliche, as above, so below. <clears throat> yeah. If you yep, yep, yep. if if you take and separate that as opposed to you know space and earth above below and you take it to mean dimensions and the idea of the torsion field and a hyper dimensional connection to our three dimensional reality the physics of vibration the physics of resonance the physics of harmony the physics of disharmony no matter where you are, should be the same, the same, the same. So if someone is trying to teach us, as they have other places on Mars, about the physics, I can easily see that this could be a template for talking about frequency, wavelength, harmony, resonance, constructive interference, destructive interference, ultimately the wave foundation of reality itself. Yeah. Um so there's, there's a piece of software that I've used in the music studio. People don't know I'm also a musician. And I spent a long time, <laughs> the name of it's gone out of my head, it will come back. But I spent a long time working with this feature that um, what you can take notes and you can play around with them, lifting them up and down, and you can expand the note as well. So if somebody had the time, probably me, <laughs> so I can get into the studio, we could take each of these dots put them onto the software and see if they actually... Oh, my God. That would sound amazing. Mm. And I wonder what it would give. I wonder if there's chords within that. Well, if, it, could... if it's a code, a geomorphic code, mm. written in the landscape because it will last the longest, 
If you make it big enough and massive enough, no matter what happens, it will still be there at some level until it's not. Uh, it sounds to me like an extremely worthwhile avenue to pursue. Yeah. Um, with this, you know, I want to let everybody know this is my first attempt looking at this structure. So how accurate I am um, is open to speculation. But, my, you know, my, my first my first um, experience with it is, as I said earlier, something jumped out at me. What I'd like you to do is go on to 1B when I started doing some further exploration. So if you could click on that for me, Richard. Oh, my. Mm. Oh, my, 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 my. I think oh. this is a two-dimensional grid plot of something. You guys, if I can cut in for a second. Yeah, by all means. Yeah, yeah, one of our listeners sent me a message and said that there is a Vernal Memorial Garden in Utah, and it's a, it's a grave site, basically. So I don't know if that's what Keith was referring to, but... Apparently, the crater in the middle of this thing is called Vernal. Oh, okay. And when I hear the word Vernal, I think of Vernal Equinox, but it's not spelled the same way. Yeah. Um, so that's one of the, you know, etymological things we'll have to decode. Uh, Ruggiero... I'm looking at what looks like a radial plot on the left, a linear plot on the right, and you've got a scale of 2.18 kilometers. Uh, is that a multiplier? Um, I think that's just the long line from uh, on, from one one grid to another. Oh, okay. So what, what I did do, I've annotated this on, on, on a sketch, unfortunately, but um, there's consistent let me talk about some of the consistencies Richard so if we go on to uh, so we've got the long line feature yeah? you see the first I call them base pair in symmetry mm-hmm yep so oh look at that there's little cute mirrors of each other that's right so this is where it gets interesting the whole the whole grid is mathematically quite interesting so base pair number one we take the first alignment of uh, point, point to point um, the bring it down this the space from tip to tip is uh, well, here it is so just stay with me for a minute base pair one tip to tip is 800 meters got that okay. that's where the pyramid it, 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 that is at the peak on the capsule yeah all right uh, the tip to tip 800 meters base to base is 500 meters exactly i think yeah because you can do the measure. Base part two of, of base pet of the pair is 700 meters tip to tip, and again repeated 500 meters base to base. Hmm. So to have two anomalies in one, you know, I think Carl Sagan said if you, if you start to see, you know, is it ge geometry? That's the first sign of artificiality. I'm not saying nature can't do stuff like this because it can pick stuff. You know, it will produce in crystalline form. Um, um, but nothing on this scale. No way. No. We, we, we abandoned that argument back at Sidonia when people were trying to tell me that the pyramids there were giant crystals. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, they're not. So, okay, when you say base, you're talking about the linear structures on the right of the image, right? Yes, yeah, so when I, when I say base, I mean actually on the ground. So you've got the tip. Yeah, but which, you... which features are we talking about? The radial ones with the lines going out like a clock or the ones on the right that are linear with cross linkages? We're, we're starting with the ones on the right. Actually. Ah, okay. Okay. We've got the first alignment of two. Can you see it? So yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'm talking tip to tip or base to base. The point is, it's either 800 meters or 500 meters. It's not like 821 meters. Hmm. And it's symmetry all the way along. I haven't even got to the angles yet. Okay, well, we don't have a lot of time, so we've got to move along here. Okay, so let's go then to the, the fan. I might just jump straight to image number... Uh, yeah, hit, hit the high points. We can always come back and do details later. Okay, image number 1C. You need to see that, Richard. Working on 1C. Oh, my God. Oh, isn't that special? Yeah, the whole right cow. With great thanks to Keith Laney for producing such amazing detailed images on which you can do real 
measurements. Yeah. So what do we got here? You got a lot of right angles. <laughs> See that? Oh, you got some interesting pyramidal forms. I'd probably put too much lines on, to be honest. But um, this is where I need to start. You know, I need to prove the accuracy with uh, some CAD software, which I've just downloaded and I will try and use for the first time. But uh, I wanted to let you think what jumps out of you as you, you've had a history of researching, you know, obviously the, the images on Cydonia. Well, the first thing I look for is 19.5 degrees or 33 or 45, um, mm. which are angles in the physics. Yeah. What about 90? Where does that come in? 19? No, 91. Uh, no, no. So you've got like a right angle triangle. There, there. Right, right. Well, right angles, remember, if you have a right angle, um, right angle is orthogonal mm -hmm. in the physics. When you get a right angle, 90 degrees, it, it basically moves stuff from the higher dimension into our 3D reality. In, if, if, you're, if you're thinking astrology, you know, right angles in a chart concretize. They, they make real stuff happening. George is probably, you know, rolling your eyes, you know, when I'm saying this. But no, 90 degrees is a part of the physics, absolutely. Okay. Um, what about straight lines? So we've also got 180 degrees. Well, we have alignments. Remember, you yeah, have you have uh, opposition alignments and conjunction alignments. And I've measured with the Accutron that when you have a conjunctive alignment, meaning things are in a line, celestial mm -hmm. bodies like during an eclipse, sun, moon, earth, you get all kinds of weird, wild, wonderful things happening with the frequency changes in the Accutron. So alignments are, again, critical in measuring the physics in 3D. With this imagery, obviously it's looking straight down, but we've got to take into the curvature of, of, of Mars. Right. Well, would the curvature of the planet slightly distort uh, what I'm seeing? So it might be more accurate than I think we're seeing, because obviously this is... Uh, well, I don't think Keith did what's called an orthogonal display which means you basically correct for that curvature mm -hmm. we actually had that done i had it done for sedonia by a professional at the rand uh, uh institute in in santa monica the mm -hmm. uh, the air force think tank uh merton davies was his name and he mm -hmm. did this kind of orthogonal you know uh, photogrammetry for nasa for jpl and mm -hmm. i had him do it for sedonia and that's how we discovered all the exquisite hyperdimensional torsion field angles because when you see the raw imagery or even the public relations products that NASA puts out they don't do these scientific corrections so you're looking like straight down and I, I, I know that Laney didn't have the time to do it so if you were to do that if you're close on things if you make it a flat 2D surface my feeling is that if it's close it'll be right on when the surface is made what's called orthogonal. Yeah, so because I think that the that, that curvature, or just sort of the flatness we've got here, when you bring it into what it actually is, will cause slightly distort the measurements, but mm -hmm. they've been enough and I'm gonna redo them for you, Richard. Do we know the scale of this? How, how wide are these structures? Yep, yep. Let me just jump back onto the original and I'll tell you. So if we take that, that long line, on the bottom, the, the, the so, one hundred. So we want to go to number one, one A. Uh, no, we want. We stay. We're going to stay on. On stay on the image you're on. Yeah. So one, two. Okay. I'm just going to measure right now for you because I've got the, I've got the live in front of me. Um, point to point. Oh, I see down on the right. It says two hundred meters. So we can. Yep. Yeah, two two kilometers. No, it says two hundred meters is the scale. Ignore that. So I'm just going through the long line, point to point. I've already measured it. It's, it's approximately two kilometers, 2.7 kilometers. The one, the one that goes to the mound on the left, across the mound in the middle to the mound on the lower right. That's right, two kilometers. Okay. okay so then See, one thing, in, when you're preparing these, you should give the, each little mound a, a number or a letter. Yep. So I, I, I would have done that. I just haven't 
had time this week, but you will, you will have a fully annotated with a fully angled um, diagram for you for some short time in the future. So if I just took mount the, ver the first mount to the second mount, so we've got the one on the very left-hand side. I see it. And then to the one above it, that's 500 meters. Oh. Yeah, exactly. So I'm just, and I'm, then I'm going to measure the one this is, above. This is, this is apex to apex. Yeah. All right. So then we've, got, we've got a little flat pyramid at the, at the top for those who are not sure what's going on, yeah? Um, again, mount to mount is 550, but you've got to, I've got to weigh up, well, where is the middle of each of those mounds? It can be a little bit difficult because there's a lot of erosion on the top of them. Yep, yep. Uh, we, are, we are running out of time, okay? We're coming up to the top of the hour, so. I've, I've spoken enough. <laughs> well, well, let me let me kind of synthesize what you found in this area that Laney did an exquisite job of creating the imagery and assembling into a gigapan is an extraordinary city a ser series of large mound-like structures, eerily rem you know, resembling the mound seen all over Britain, particularly around Stonehenge, and these are spaced mathematically, geometrically. They appear to be communicating some kind of message, and you're seeing patterns that imply the message has something to do with frequency, harmonics, and wavelengths, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Super. And this is, we have no idea where the Vernal Crater is. If someone in the audience can look up where Vernal Crater is on Mars, it might be kind of nice to know where on Mars. But since we find, we're finding stuff all over Mars, have for decades um, exactly where it is is not crucial it's just that apparently in this place they chose to lay out something over the scale of miles that is teaching us about harmonic and frequency which of course is the cornerstone of the physics Richard I just want to add one more point and if we go down to my 2a and 2b and we see a place in France, which I've been to, called Carnac. Oh, Carnac, yes, yes. So, so this, I would assume, was made by um, the, our ancient culture that probably got, uh, was the remnants of a culture that got um, left behind, so a, AKA the work of uh, Brian Forrester. So this is man-made stuff, and it doesn't look as accurate as the stuff that we're seeing um, on on Mars, if that makes sense. So we're, we're, I think this is from a, obviously a, the Stone Age culture that might have been left behind mm -hmm. in the previous culture that, that uh, you know, might have inhabited our planet. Mm. So the, the survivors of the catast catastrophe. Well, um, when you have the transposition of an entire culture, not mm. just from one continent to another or one country to another, but from one planet to another. And then you have generations in between. What will the later, you know, 100 generations, 1,000 generations later, what will they do with the cultural memory that was bequeathed to them as their archives, their libraries, their, their uh, you know, verbal, ceremonial uh, rituals, whatever. In other words, how faithful will they be able to reproduce the original materials on the place they left if yeah. they're limited to either human memory or ritual you know passage from one generation to the next if they don't have text they don't have imagery or diagrams it's all done you know through memorization I mean I'm surprised we see so much that appears so accurate in, in, in the record now, because the, the ways of preserving this stuff was so primitive and so much gets lost even in one generation, unless you're incredibly obsessively scrupulous about preserving it. Yeah. Um, Andrew, yeah. thoughts? Well, uh, another listener, I think it's the same listener as before. Uh, sent us where this is on Mars, and it's very interesting. So, Vernal is a crater on Mars located at Oxia Pallas Quadrangle. Um, anyways, listen to this. Uh, 
there were mineral deposits. It was like a hot spring, and there could be, an, which comes close to hot springs on Earth, and it is thought to have been formed by the movement of fluids along the boundaries of dipping beds. But they also say there could be remnants of life here. So it's a very interesting, you know, dip, hmm. as we say. Yeah. Okay. Well, we are um, basically up against it. We're at the top of the hour, the witching hour here in the Land of Enchantment, moving from May 1 to May 2. And when we come back, we may have Jim Saunders with us, and he has some interesting things to talk about in terms of the helicopter. Remember, he's a nautical engineer, a nautical designer, so he knows design. And we've been saying rather pejorative things about little ingenuity. I'm going to have to retract a couple of those, but I'll wait until we get Andrew on to do that. Uh, and so that's going to be uh, what we're going to talk about when we return. My guests this morning are Ruggiero Kahlo and Andrew Curry. We've been discussing some of the interesting geometric um, aspects of uh, this extraordinary set of mounds spread across several miles or kilometers in a uh, distant region of Mars, nowhere uh, near close to Jezero. And then we were going to get back to talking about the temple and the freeze tigrams, the imagery, the gargoyles, if you will, that are plainly visible on the vertical sides of this extraordinary 700-foot-long structure with a round uh, annex, which is roughly three hundred feet across. You're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. We shall return. Midnight.com. Tune in to listen to Richard C. Hogland and his fascinating guests. Support the broadcast and don't miss another groundbreaking conversation. Join Club 19.5 to get access to exclusive member benefits. Listen to past episodes anytime on any device. Search the archives of over 180 episodes. Membership costs $9.95 a month, 33 cents a day. Talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought. The other side is midnight.com. Welcome back. A witching hour in the land of enchantment in the high desert of New Mexico. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, my guests this morning so far are Andrew Curry and Ruggiero Kahlo. Waiting in the wings is, of course, uh, uh, Keith Morgan. And Kinsia is hovering back there. She had an exhausting day, so um, she asked uh, permission not to... Um, you know, say what she wants to say about some of this stuff until maybe next weekend. And I'm looking forward to her, her having time to kind of look at some of this art because the art is amazing. Um, I also want to uh, tell everyone that uh, what we're going to do now is we're going to dip into mission control. Because remember, uh, we're literally looking or listening to the entry of a human manned spacecraft. Actually, there's one woman aboard as well. And if I do the right thing here, uh, I think I can... Sometimes there's too many things to do. There we are. Okay, let's see what they're saying in uh, Hawthorne and Houston. 
moments away from hearing the beginning of the G orbit burn. Ah, uh, and as as I was talking, the um, the the trunk itself, and as well as the propellant used in this deorbit burn, once all is said and done, we'll be shedding about six thousand pounds uh, of mass from the Dragon spacecraft. So starting off at around twenty-seven thousand pounds, all going down to about twenty-one thousand pounds. So those help. Uh, uh, sort of carry when they deploy and eventually slow down the spacecraft. This is just absolutely an incredible view, and this is coming to us from the International Space Station. So I do still have a little bit of an eye on Dragon. Uh, once Crew Dragon begins that re-entry period following the deorbit burn completion, we uh, hope to have infrared imagery thanks to the WV-57 aircraft. Uh, that has departed from Ellington and is in the proper location. And they have thermal imagery uh, systems aboard. And, and fingers crossed we get some visuals of Crew Dragon re-entering the Earth's atmosphere. And right on time, we also have the start of the deorbit burn. As we mentioned, this should last 16 minutes, 26 seconds. So this has fully committed uh, Crew Dragon to coming home. So just within the last 10 minutes, Crew Dragon jettisoned its trunk and initiated this deorbit burn just a minute ago. And, and that's a good time to kind of dip out of this. We will come back in. It takes about uh, 45 minutes from the time in Earth orbit you do a burn to when you re-enter the Earth's atmosphere literally halfway around the world. Because remember, one full orbit is 90 minutes. So home and transfer orbits are, you do something here, <clears throat> half an orbit later is when it actually takes place. So they will be re-entering the Earth's atmosphere in about 45 minutes. So toward the end of the other side of midnight, because it is the other side of midnight now, uh, we'll come back to Houston and to Hawthorne, and we'll pick up uh, on the actual uh, uh, entry and, and landing. So in the meantime, uh, Andrew, let's go back to you and pick up. Uh, before we do that, let me ask this. Is... Uh, Tim Saunders with us. Good morning. Yes, I am. Oh, and he's had his tea. I can tell. You can tell. The old gray is in, in, the, in the voice. Yes, yeah, there we go. Have you been able to listen to any of the conversation for the last couple of hours? I haven't actually, no. no. It's, it's early early doors here, so <laughs> I'm literally just waking up. Now we're going to we're gonna have to move Turkey or move you. So... <clears throat> Okay, sounds like a good plan. So where would you like to pick up? We've talked about a little bit about Ingenuity and how they transferred her um, responsibilities from tech demo to now operational demo, which, of course, is the only logical thing they could do. Uh, I don't know why they didn't announce they might do this in the beginning, um, but they're doing it, and I'm incredibly happy. Um, I said a little while ago that I made some comments in our conversation that were somewhat derogatory, and I'm going to take those back now, because I've actually got a copy uh, on the um, uh, Other Side of Midnight website in my items. Let me go tell you where they are. Clicking on fast links. I'm so glad Kinthea has figured out how to do this. So if you go to item number 11, the one that was made up by the Perseverance team uh, a day or so ago we made a poster with Ingenuity uh, kind of poised in mid-flight and in the bottom they have a I want to believe um, sign post which is very uh, emblematic of the X-Files and that covers a multitude of sins you know we all want to believe that all the things that we're looking at are in fact corroboratable and are true. If you click on that, item number 11, in my uh, items tonight in Radio Pictures, you will find a manual um, put out by the project. This was a paper that was published by the AIAA, which is the American Institute for Aeronautics and Astronautics, one of the most venerated uh, aerospace institutions in America. And if you uh, look at this, it says Mars helicopter technology demonstrator it's uh, uh, Bob Ballaram who's the chief engineer it's got a whole bunch of other uh, JPL scientists and engineers 
who also are listed in the paper. Everything you wanted to know, sounds like an old Johnny Carson line. Everything you ever wanted to know, but didn't know who to ask about the Ingenuity helicopter is in this paper, including a section on the power and energy system. And one of the little things that I kind of skipped over in my, uh, again, you know, misplaced derogatory comments, I kept saying that little tiny solar panel wouldn't be very uh, very much use on Mars, where sunlight is much dimmer because you're farther from the sun. And the size of it, even if it's a super highly efficient 50% converter, it still would. It turns out I was wrong about all that. And I'll tell you why. Because they're only flying it on a cadence of once a week. If it sits there and the power curves for the heating and the other loads on the batteries are listed, when you do the numbers, there's more than enough energy to fly this little thing on the solar panel if you trickle charge the batteries from exposing it to sunlight for a few Martian days. And if you're only flying like once a week and you're only flying for like two, two or three minutes, there's more than enough energy within known physics to allow little ingenuity to work the way it's advertised. And frankly, I'm very happy because the more I can drive away the conspiracy aspects of what NASA's doing and hone in on the verifiable technical uh, engineering, the better. What do you think? Well, I would say that you were not alone in being derogatory. I was also very derogatory about the, uh, I think I called it a pathetic little solar panel <laughs> and uh, clunky looking design, apart from the feet and the rotor blade. But I mean, I, I think that just because there's a paper with um, one hell of a lot of nomen nomenclature, did you actually check out some of these equations? Because to me, it was, uh, the paper didn't really turn me on. I just thought it was a massive, letters and uh, everything else, but I didn't actually see very much about the solar panel. And again, we have to take it all on face value. But just, you know, if you look at something... Well, uh, no, it says your solar panel is made from inverted metamorphic cells from Solo Aero Technologies. The cell are optimized for Mars solar spectrum and occupy a rectangular area of 680 square centimeters of, of substrate. 544 centimeters active cell area in a region centered immediately above the coaxial rotors. And again, if you have a very small amount of electricity that you can store it over a long period of time, I mean, that's how, that's how perseverance and curiosity work. You have I get all of that, Richard, but it, it doesn't tell us, it doesn't prove any more that they're just saying that it works. It's a very fancy way of them saying, we, we, we say it works. That's it. Well, unless you, know, you want to believe that all the videos are totally faked in, in some, you know, back room at JPL, um, I'm, I'm seeing little subtle things. Like one of the things that Ron and I were discussing earlier in the week was, is this thing really a T. Townsend ground device? Meaning instead of flying by rotors, it's actually flying by a variant of electrogravitics. You know, an anti-gravity technology developed by Townsend Brown back in the 1920s and documented very, very meticulously by a friend and colleague of ours, uh, Paul LaViolette, in his book on anti-gravity and all of the black ops, you know, U.S. government secret projects, which have been working on this stuff since the 1950s. And Brown was working on it uh, since the 1920s. Anyway, if you if you don't want that kind of exotic technology, which came out of our discussion of alternate power sources apart from solar cells, mm -hmm. and you say the thing is flying on the rotors, one thing we know about helicopters is in order to fly on rotors, if you want to go in a certain direction, the helicopter has to tilt. Sure. If you look at the videos, the helicopter is flying and tilting exactly the way it should if it's really flying on Mars in an atmosphere and the rotors are doing the work. And it accelerates and then they rotate the other way and they slow down because, you know, action reaction, you have to 
kind of tilt your rotors in the direction away from where you're going to use the, the wash to slow down before you can hover and then land. All, all of that is in these videos. That's why number eight, look at it again and again and again. You'll see all the subtle features. That, now you can say, as any conspiracy can, well, the conspirators are thinking of all of this. They programmed in all of these details to make it convincing. And of course, that line of reasoning goes nowhere because at some point you can say, well, you know, like Musk is saying, all of life is a virtual reality program and we're nothing but pawns of some super, super AI. At some point, that is not a useful conversation. So I'm assuming this morning, A, the helicopter is flying the way we're told. It's powered the way we're told. It's performing the way we're told. And I'm much more intrigued with their transition from the tech demo to the operational usage of ingenuity to be a scout in the Perseverance Science mission because where they're going, they're, by the way, they decided to take the southern route, where they're going brings them much closer to the really amazing, <clears throat> massive pyramidal arcology structures to the south part of Yezero, including the ones that are angled just like the pyramids at Giza to mimic the belt stars of Orion. And although the rover would take years to get there, they could hop with ingenuity from landing pad to landing pad to landing pad. And they could give us aerials, stunning aerials of these massive structures within a year, which again, geopolitically, depending upon what the Chinese are doing, would put us in the time frame of what I think of as the potential disclosure window which opens up after June because of the Senate Intelligence Committee and their report to be made public on the unidentified aerial phenomenon that the Nimitz and the Roosevelt and the New York Times have been talking about 2017. So do we have a date? That's in June sometime. Do we have a date? It, it was supposed to be June 1. There have been, it's now they're saying toward the end of June and I think these are all movable feasts because there's a lot of backroom negotiation going on. Like, why are the Chinese, who got there into orbit before we did, why are they waiting? They're not waiting to do many rather aggressive things down here on planet Earth. But when they could scoop NASA and scoop the world and become immortalized, a culture which is overly focused on the concept of heaven, again, Heaven, 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 you know, um, heavenly uh, harmony is the name of their new space station. Uh, Questions of heaven is the name of the Mars mission with a orbiter, a lander, and a rover. But they're waiting for something. And as I said last week, I think they're waiting to collaboratively explore the archaeology in the open of Yezero, and all that is waiting for the right time when we move into that phase of terrestrial geopolitics where we admit we're not alone and we had ancestors and they came from Mars. I think they're probably waiting for the correct landing coordinates because uh, why, why would you go out on, on path finding when you can wait for somebody else to do it and it lands exactly in the right place. So. Well, NASA has been doing it for decades and we know the Chinese have stolen everything that NASA has got. <clears throat> they advertise that with their poster. Remember their poster for he Questions of Heaven with the little lander and the rover sitting on it posted in front of a curiosity mission of an ancient arcology at Gale Crater, mm -hmm. which Absolutely. of course was their, you know, Emily Dickinson between the lines this is what we're going to do, boys and girls. We're going to announce there's human structures on another planet. So given that they've stolen everything from NASA in terms of landing sites and environmental parameters and all that, what could they be waiting for? The one legitimate thing, and there's no way to know this for certain, but the one legitimate thing that they could be doing while they're upstairs in orbit, they could be checking 
on the atmosphere of Mars itself. Because as we've been saying now for weeks, from all these various lines of circumstantial evidence, including some comments that uh, Bob Balaman made at the press conference a couple days ago regarding the, the power curves of how much energy Ingenuity is using to fly, I think he mm. kind of slipped, and it seems to be a lot easier, and they're lo using a lot less energy, and that would imply a thicker, more benign atmosphere for flying. You know, we don't have a yeah. memo, but we have all these little bits and pieces of outside evidence that point toward the atmosphere is different than NASA's been telling the world for 50 years. If the Chinese want to successfully land, they have to in situ check out the atmosphere themselves, and that should be why they're waiting, because it takes time to do the right science so you don't crack. True, true. I mean, I don't wish to go full circle about this solar panel, but I am cynical because to me it doesn't look big enough, and you can say, yes, you have a paper that says it is big enough, but still, I find from what I do in my day job is, you know, quite often when I calculate something, it is almost exactly as the first idea that popped into my head about the size, the thickness of a piece of metal, aluminium or steel, or whatever we're building, the thickness of glass, and I'm, you know, because intrinsically uh, we have an ability to come up with the answer without having to display it in a, in a methodical sort of, you know, textual way. And that's just basically tapping into our experience and our knowledge. So I'm saying that the solar panel does not appear to be big enough. And I, I listened to this press conference, um, the NASA JPL press conference. I think it was quite long, quite you know, full of a panel of different people all wearing an array of very tightly uh, drawn different types of masks. And, uh, you know, <laughs> a little bit comic really in my opinion but I was interested to hear uh, one of the, the the points was that the the battery is not the bottleneck in terms of the flight duration no uh, that's brand new but don't you know that's a brand new item yeah but apparently the bottleneck is the overheating of the motors and they claim that the every one second that the motors are running the temperature elevates by one degree Celsius. Mm -hmm. So if you're flying for 117 seconds, then presumably you're going from whatever the ambient temperature is to something in excess of the boiling points of water on Earth, so 117 degrees. So that's that's the reason why they keep the flight short, apparently. Well, but see, yeah. that, that's a very different statement than they made in the beginning. I know. See, that's I, what well, I'm well, but see, that's, that's another. Why I'm cynical. <laughs> but no, no. See, that's why I think it's a, it's a window into reality, because what are the what are the only three ways you can get rid of heat in three dimensional reality? Conduction, right? Right. Convection, right? Right. And radiation. Conduct Indeed. conduction is if you put your hand on a hot stove, you don't keep it there long because it conducts the stove to your hand and it gets very painful in milliseconds, okay? Yeah. Convection is when you have an atmosphere, and the atmosphere, the gases are literally boiling, roiling, moving, convecting, uh, and carrying, transporting the heat away. The third way, radiation, is when you uh, just heat an object up, and it radiates in, in the uh, energy but the other two uh, sources of getting rid of heat, convection or conduction, uh, are not operative because there is no air. There's no atmosphere. You're in space. You're in a vacuum. The fact that they're now limited by uh, not power, but by the heat capacity of the motor in that little box tells me something has changed, like... The ambient temperature on Mars is supposed to be, when they're doing these flights, um, like 18 or 20 below zero Fahrenheit mm -hmm. during the day, and like 130 
below at night, okay? And because the atmosphere is supposed to be so thin, 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 mainly you're getting rid of, of the heat through radiation. Conduction yes. and convection don't really apply. No. However, if the atmosphere of Mars is fluffier, if it's denser, it means the temperature regime in which they're flying is totally different. And the ambient temperature outside must be a lot warmer because of greenhouse effects. Um, and so they're starting at a much higher temperature. And so temperature becomes critical because even if it's somewhat denser atmosphere, let's say one-tenth the Earth's atmosphere as opposed to one one-hundredth, that's not going to be enough to convect away the heat. So it's going to be um, basically a heat balance where in this box, which is at an ambient that's much higher than we've been told, that motor temperature can go up, as you said, to above the boiling point of water very quickly if you run it more than a couple of minutes. So again, another circumstantial piece of evidence between the lines that they're not limited by the battery or the amount of accumulated energy from the little solar panel. They're limited mm -hmm. by the environment, which says, like all the other things I've been pointing out, the atmosphere of Mars has to be thicker by a factor mm. of 10. We should also think, remember that the, when the rotor blades are rotating, that will also cause some form of downdraft, hence the fact that it gives lift. And that downdraft in itself will also cool uh, the the motors to some extent, not very much. Not very will. much, no, no, no. Yeah, well, during this press conference, uh, there was an opportunity for people to communicate through social media. So I, I just plugged away. I asked three questions, and the first one was yeah, a little bit cheeky. I said, "The solar panel doesn't look big enough to me. Could you please explain the capacity, uh, the capability of the panel that the." the battery and also the capacity of the uh, typical motor drain. Um, they didn't answer, of course. Hmm. The second question I asked for um, is, is the density of the atmosphere on Mars as you expected? I note it was necessary to upload modified code to Ingenuity prior to the first delayed flight, and they didn't answer. And the third question was, why does Perseverance keep tracking multiple photos um, of the Martian sky? What are you mapping? And again, that wasn't answered either. <laughs> I wonder why. Well, I'm not surprised because can you imagine how many people all over the world are trying to get questions in? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't read anything positive or negative. It's just that I, I thought of doing that myself, um, and I figured it was a kind of a lost leader because the idea that throwing one pebble in a pond will possibly get any well, attention with a million other pebbles is. You say that, Richard, but it was a very early press conference. It was something like eight thirty in the morning. And the other point was that when I, between my questions, which were not, you know, it takes a few seconds for me to type these questions and think and uh, contemplate what you know, may happen, and see if they even react. But between my questions, there were only about, let's say, 15 other questions from people on the planet. So when you say a pebble in the pond... But you don't know the total number. number. You only know the numbers they picked to, to, uh, to uh, no, read. No, you see the Twitter feed. Twitter feed is the complete collection. Oh, they have other sources. They have Facebook. They've got um, Instagram. True. It's not just you know. There's but a the whole comment. They're, they're, comment they're, they're, in this press conference were going through this one one channel. That's what I'm saying. There were not that many people online. Strangely. Hmm. Well, I mean, if that's true, it again doesn't give us anything that's positive. Because I can see why your questions are so technical, they might think they're not appealing to a general audience and pick something that's more fuzzy and lovable and all that, which I think a couple of you kind of were. Like, for instance, when they asked Mimi, <clears throat> what, how did the rover, uh, how did the helicopter feel? Remember that one? I, I think I filtered that one out. <laughs> she was asked, how did the little helicopter feel flying on Mars, and she did this whole lyrical thing about it felt freedom, and all. I mean, it was totally absurd, technically, but it's the kind of 
you know, uh, uh, there used to be a term for this. Um, uh, I, I forget what the news term is. For something that's kind of at the, quote, level of the common person that they can relate to. So I wouldn't, I, I would say that ignoring your techno questions, to me, it doesn't mean there's a weird political thing there. It's just that they were too technical for what they were trying to do. Um, we are coming down to the bottom of the hour. When we come back, you have some audio I think you want to play for us. And I want to go back to talk about the atmosphere. Uh, we've got uh, um, Andrew, who I think has can think of been able to post your uh, your uh, sketches of the temple freezes yet. Yes, she did. Excellent. So we've got all that. Plus, do this. Everything is really lining up perfectly for Splashdown tonight, and we are we are continuing to watch Crew Dragon execute all of the pre-programmed maneuvers. Uh, the next major one now with the nose cone secured and all of those hooks secured. Uh, and we have that to come back to. So, everyone stay exactly where you are. We're on the other side of midnight. My name is Richard C. Hoagland. Um, we will definitely be returning right after these messages. Hoagland here. I'd like you to support The Other Side of Midnight by subscribing to Club 19.5 and thereby joining our unique and growing radio community. Tune in to listen to our fascinating guests, pioneers on the out there edge of science and thought, and gain access to exclusive member benefits. To do this, just visit our website, theothersideofmidnight.com, and click on the Join Club 19.5 link in the navigator bar or in the left-hand column. Membership costs $19.95 a month. That's 33 tetrahedral cents a day. I mean, it's the price of a couple of cups of coffee. As a Club 19.5 member, you'll gain access to this show and literally hundreds of previous shows on hundreds of different topics going back to 2015 that we've done. Our archive shows have the commercials removed, and you'll be able to download the MP2 files directly from the 19 Point Archives if you prefer. To enhance your listener experience, a new The Other Side of Midnight podcast is being added to all show pages, which will allow you to instantly search the show archives of Radio with Pictures, thus easily accessing the corresponding show. Plus, you can just as quickly access the entire podcast list when you're on the go. I want to personally thank all our Club 19.5 members because without your continuing support, this show would literally not be on the air. Please continue supporting the broadcast to provide you with the most interesting conversation available, talk radio at the cutting edge of science and thought, and if you like what you hear on the other side of midnight, tell your friends and continue growing the show by having them subscribe to Club 19.5 as well, because we need all of you. When I say we need you, you're the reason we're doing all this. Oakland, over and out.
And welcome back, everyone, to the other side of midnight. One half hour to go. We've got a space mission about to enter the atmosphere and plop down a few miles offshore of Panama City with four human beings on board and a gorgeous last quarter moon shining on a placid, almost still as a lake, Gulf of Mexico. Meanwhile, on the planet Mars, about 100 million miles away, there are two little robots, one about the size of an SUV, the other somewhat smaller than a bread box. And the one that's smaller than the bread box, it can fly. So I'll tell you what, um, Andrew, um, I want to pick up several things on the helicopter, because to me, the helicopter represents a stunning breakthrough in how we're going to get the truth. And I want to direct everyone to my radio with pictures. Um, um, what you want to do is look at number nine. This is written by the uh, so-called pilot of Ingenuity, who's really a computer programmer sitting in a nice, uh, you know, air-conditioned office there at JPL, writing code and looking at engineering inputs and all that. It's a very long piece describing a lot of technical details about their flight so far in terms of control moments, accelerations, uh, movement through the air, uh, wind gusts. I, uh, uh, Tim, I am blown away how casually JPL keeps talking about wind gusts. During the entire X-15 program, or during uh, Kittinger, who was the first guy to jump out of a stratospheric balloon at 70-some thousand feet, you know, decades ago. I never heard anybody talk about wind gusts at 100,000 feet over the planet. I mean, the air is just so damn thin, yet they keep talking about how um, little ingenuity has to constantly correct for wind gusts and how they're measuring the wind. And it matches what the, uh, you know, the um, uh, meteorology experiment on Perseverance itself is is measuring, except at altitude, you know, uh, five, ten meters up, the winds are a little stronger as they get stronger when you go higher because the surface drag is, is less. You know, the what they call that, um, not uh, turbidity currents or uh, drag or whatever, the, the air moving across the surface, there's a certain amount of drag that keeps the velocities lower. Anyway, they're acting as if this is a much denser atmosphere, but they don't say it. But everything that we're looking at, all these various inputs, are telling me that the atmosphere of Mars has got to be at least 10 times denser than the atmosphere that we've been told about for 50 years. Richard, if I may, it's Andrew here. Yeah, sure. Is this one of those situations where um, they have to get a peer-reviewed scientific study put into place before they can actually admit it? Or, I mean, what is with being cagey about this? Do you know what I mean? Like, do they have to check off certain boxes first and really have everybody agree who is, you know, pertinent in this study? It's a very good question that you ask. Or are they just pulling the wool over our eyes. You know, I find the title of the Ingenuity helicopter, I want to believe. <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> come on. I mean, and then the first thing it's in the first paragraph is, you know, we're going to get small payloads and move them to, It's you know, like they're, they're telling us, they're, like, if this thing goes up, it's going to show us the layout of Jezero City. If it can get close to the freezes, we're going to see gargoyle staring at it just like as if it's up against notre dame cathedral unless they mess around with the camera again i want to believe ah uh, i don't know it, 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 you know it's a shell game and i'd like to know are we having to go through procedures or are we following another ritual i think it's both i think the ritual is overwhelming because remember if, if we're dealing with the high church of nasa <clears throat> if these people are somehow either self-appointed or appointed by the shadowy forces that run the planet Earth, which we're going to talk about 
with my Masonic expert tomorrow night. These, these shows have been carefully crafted to kind of fit together. How much is a small group really running everything? Remember, I've been saying over and over again that the political realities of China versus the U.S., the Communist Chinese Party versus, you know, uh, the two parties in the United States is not really where it's at. That's all a shell game. It's kind of a false front for Temkin Village. The real, real politic is much bigger, much deeper, and much more important to these people. And everything else is just kind of like window dressing. And the fact that the Chinese have been sitting in orbit for two months while NASA does all this stuff, given where this stuff is, which leads me elegantly to item number two, Andrew, in your uh, radio with pictures. So everybody click on item number two in Andrew's uh, fast link and talk to us about item number two, because this is now, by attaching ingenuity formally to the Perseverance mission, it has now put this extraordinary, incredible, incredibly large and large scale and sophisticated set of ruins that are just to the south of where Percy landed within reach of an innovative helicopter reconnaissance program. Because remember, Ingenuity is totally autonomous. Ingenuity has on board something like two gigs of memory. It's got the fastest processor in the solar system, except for those here on Earth. It can do its own mission of reconnaissance by literally moving, as my grandmother would say, from lily pad to lily pad to lily pad. In other words, if you were really conducting a clandestine archaeological mission of the stuff that's to the south, and I want you to describe what you've done here in a moment, the way you do it is you have little ingenuity go from right field to a new flight, which will be flight number five. I think they're going to pick a new landing place and then stage from there. And then you pick one further on and one further on and one further on. And they're all safe because you check them out with the cameras, you know, so there are no rocks and all that. You simply program it to go from point A to point B to point C to point D to point F. And then from F to E to D to E to C to A or B and then to A. In other words, the whole thing can be done automatically. It doesn't have to check in. And they're telling us they're only going to be flying another couple of times in the coming month. What does that tell us? It tells us that they wanted to do a clandestine mission and send ingenuity off in a safe way to accumulate lots and lots of data, aerial imagery for 3D topo maps and stereo and all of that. All that could be done on the, on the QT and when it gets back within range, which is 3,000 feet, it can communicate by radio to Perseverance. It downloads all of the data it's stored in its two gig memory because programs don't take a lot of imaging that does, you know, mosaics, that kind of thing. That can eat up memory very quickly. But even if each image was like, you know, uh, one megabyte, in a two gig memory, you could store a thousand images. There's no way that they could exhaust a thousand images on this hopping from, as my grandmother said, um, lily pad to lily pad to lily pad. And, and, you know, to me, this is what they've decided to do, to run a parallel reconnaissance mission using ingenuity, which is performing really, really well in every regard. And so you want to read, uh, what's his name, the, the, the flight guy, you know, whose uh, <clears throat> document I posted to see how well it's going. I think that this mission now has a formal Oumuamua, a scout, to secretly do reconnaissance on what you're going to talk about now in item number two. Yeah. Um, can you set up the image that I used? This was actually from last week, um, so I'm lagging behind you, the scout, 
richer <laughs> by you, a week. But... You, you have it posted at the top of item number two. Oh, what we're after. Yeah. Yeah, this is simply part of that mosaic, that pan yeah. produced by the um, EDL uh, lander vision system camera that was looking down as Perseverance landed on, on, on the parachute. And so this particular um, citizen scientist took an algorithm that stretched that out so you could see it as an oblique, like you were in the helicopter looking down on it. And you see this stunning array of massive pyramids and enclosures and intricate, you know, lattice work and right angles and, and things that look like um, freeways. And they're all just south of where Perseverance is going with a little helicopter that can tag along or go ahead and it doesn't need to report back every night. It can sit and do its thing for days before it comes back and dumps its data in Perseverance's computers. Yeah, so uh, just to let everybody know exactly what Richard said is that this is one of um, the images of Perseverance when it first landed. And this suddenly popped up on the citizen scientists. I, I, I don't know if it was a Reddit thing, Richard or not, but the point is it got inserted again, and it's like, oh, isn't that cool? Nice topography of Jezero. No, it, there's geometry here, and I, I zoned in on a couple of spots, or yeah, a couple of spots that are sort of, I think, kind of joined up. And again, you, again, Richard, just to let everybody know, as Ruggiero knows, you know, you really have to spend some time in these images, but once you do, Everything comes out. I, if again, I, I don't unless Mars is like segmented and put together with walls, like like their mountains. Then I, I'm I'm baffled by the by the natural processes of Mars. Because Richard, these are structures, and some of these ones at the bottom that you kind of captured. Because I, I know you did a little work on this image in terms of a bit of processing. It just brought out again right angles and where I would put if I was designing a city. I would put these build what I'm calling buildings, basically kind of aligned like this. And there's these beautiful curvatures that I, you know, like you say, they're almost like roadways. You can see it in my drawing that I've brought out. And I, I started to get overwhelmed. The more I looked at this, and the more I go, oh my gosh, I could do a whole layout. <laughs> and then I wanted to go down low and imagine what this thing looks like from a sort of a lower angle, which is what the helicopter is going to do. So yeah, over and over again, if you if you gloss over it, sure, it just looks like, eh, it's just some mounds and it's just some volcanic type activity from billions of no 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 no. This stuff is unbelievable. Well, it's, the, it's, the, the the magic word is organization. Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah, and I, I, you you just have to you can feel it. Anybody who looks at a topographical map of any city, um. I've been putting in the chat box, um, a friend of the show, Robert Morningstar, has been watching SpaceX coming down, and I know Richard will give us an update, and he's been um, watching the the astronauts who are sitting there cool as cucumbers, and when they're coming down, if they're – well, they're at night, so they're not going to see lights, but if they were in the daytime, this is the kind of organization they would see right here on terrestrial Earth, and Richard, this is what we're seeing over and over again, and – if we come out of that and go to my number three, um, if, if we could do that, what I did here is I put the same drawing that I did and lined it up with this these fascinating comics that I found on that um, website we were talking about that talks about um, John Carter of Mars and um, th th these beautiful these beautiful um, comics. For, I, I'm not sure how old they are, but the first one. Is called Horts, and, and uh, it it looks like a city buried, literally like the drawing that I did based on the image that Richard brought to my attention, They're half buried in the sand. And in the comic, the, the comment is the city is Horts, and it says, water built it, lack of water spelled its doom. And that was from John Carter. And then below that is another city called Dorvas, which is actually not part of the original canon. But the point is, these artists were visualizing something, Richard, and now we're doing it here. So organization and ancient, half-buried, totally eroded and destructed, um, uh, yeah, destructed um, cityscapes. Absolutely. See, if you took, showed any of this to a city planner, 
they would instantly recognize not the form, but the geometric layout. There's, there's nothing random about those plazas. There's nothing random about those alignments. Those two twins, those yeah. two eroded twin massive pyramids. I mean, we're talking structures which are miles across. We're talking Sidonia scale structures, but they're newer. And one of the fun things is going to be to try to, to duplicate um, the, uh, the actual time sequence. I think we got something going on. We got an infrared image from the RB-47s. We're going to mission control. bottom first, and um, uh, that lightweight material. Oh, I can see, I can see the fireball behind the re-entering spacecraft on NASA TV. Here, as it leaves that trail behind, um, and then again that that. The illuminations from all that heat um, that is building up uh, due to friction of just the re-entry speeds of Dragon when it meets the Earth's atmosphere. And that view coming from the boat, Go Navigator, Crew Dragon continuing, as you said, into to enter Earth's atmosphere. So uh, having these two views right now with it being a, a nighttime splashdown, pretty exciting that we're getting... Uh, two, two good views upon re-entry into Earth's atmosphere. This is the kind of stuff we used to do with CBS. We take feeds from several different quarters. A lot of things are happening. Actualities. Uh, pretty rapidly here in about three minutes. The first set of parachutes. Okay, so we'll here. dip out of that. Andrew, you wanted to go to another item, please? Yes. So, um, thank you, Kinthea. As usual, she's a goddess. <laughs> and she got it done <laughs> with all of us cats. I lost where I'm at. But if you go to my items. Item number one in yeah. Andrew's section. Oh, look at this. Oh, my God. Look at this. Meow, 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 yeah. meow, Holy so, cow. Yeah. So, Richard, can you quickly describe the image again? I know we're getting close to the end, but it, the top image is, is something that you um, brought my attention to. Yeah, well, we earlier talked. in the week, um, they, uh, the very top one is a series of mosaics stitched together from this super cam telescope that's on Perseverance, which I think has about a 10 to one magnification. So they simply took image after image after image across the squat cylindrical face of what I call the roundhouse section of the temple, which is two miles to the west of this. And um, they put them together and they did a horrible job so I did a lot of work. I spent days doing this, bringing out, you know, trying to filter the noise, trying to filter the vignetting, because the images are much brighter in the center than they are at the edges and all that. Finally, I got something that I could see. Then I realized that the best preserved stuff was not on the left. It was on the far right, because that's where the winds are prevailing most of the time from the south, west, and west, which means the left part of this set of freezes uh, in this cylindrical fashion, several hundred feet high and 300 feet wide, um, um, would be, uh, you know, facing erosion by the prevailing atmospheric winds on Mars. But the protected side, which is on the on the far right, that's the north and the northeast corner. You can't have a corner on a on a round building, but as it curves around, that part is better protected. And that's where the most preserved stuff is. And oh my God, look what you found there. You know, I was, tonight I was looking at uh, my old cat. Uh, I know um, Ruggiero was talking about his old 16 year old cat. I have a 15 year old cat. And he was sitting, he usually walks on my work, and I was frantically trying to get work done. And he was, I told him, you got to stay on my paper shredders right now, which is beside me. And he looked at me, Richard, with such fondness and affection. I looked straight into his eyes, you know, he's, he's an old man, he's been around uh, our home a long time. And it was the same kind of thing I saw staring out of this wall. I know I may be waxing poetic a bit, but this is the kind of stuff we see over and over and over again. And in this particular region... You can almost see the whiskers! You know, I know, I know, it's, it's, it's extraordinary. And I'm going to do more work over the week to pull more of this out for next weekend. Um, because there's so much more. And you're right, the imagery... Or the, 
the, the sculptures to the left are way more worn down, but you can still catch these mm-hmm. regular glimpses of them, and they're spaced out beautifully, and I'll, I'll capture it, but I don't know at what point do we not acknowledge there's something going on here that's you know, beyond natural processes. It's just becoming so obvious. And if that camera on Ingenuity can take any clarity of pictures, it's going to be stunning. And it's going to come from multiple angles. That's one thing Keith Laney always said is if we get images of a particular feature from a few different angles to prove that it's still, you know, it's still working from different angles in terms of it's um, what we think it is, then it's incontrovertible. Yeah, what's the word? It's it's incontrovertible. Undoubt- incontrovertible. Thank you. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's. I, I could go all day on this. And there's and and the beautiful thing, Richard, is that these these faces, they seem to almost meld into the next. And there's almost like sometimes you can see two at the same time, but not quite. And it's almost multi-dimensional, which to me says something about the people that made it. You talked about it being almost like cubism. And, you know, the, the big feature of cubism is that the artists were trying to look at every single surface of an object okay. at the same time. Moving from Mars back to Earth, I just saw... I think Cubby's and concurs. Nominal decent, right? The drogues open. She's now on the mains. Coming from the WB-57, very clear image of those four main parachutes slowing the vehicle down to what will be about 16 miles per hour prior to splashdown just off the coast of Panama City, Florida. If it were daylight, we would have an image of those four beautiful parachutes being orange and white and still getting these incredible views, even though we are in a nighttime splashdown. Okay, Tim, um, I wanted to play your your uh, sound. It's what, about three minutes? Yeah, it's, uh, it, we don't need to play the full thing. I think it comes fairly soon. Just to give some context, this is a, an excerpt from uh, a one-on-one interview with Elon Musk, which was done recently to explain the carbon capture competition, which he's set up. With, uh, no, wait, wait. I'm seeing it says helicopter ingenuity flying on Mars. Why the fourth flight was rescheduled? So that's not the one. Then I don't. Just, then I then I don't have the other sound bite. Okay. You, and we, and we, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, we don't have much time because we're five minutes to the end of the show. Um, they're about to splash down. There's an amazing infrared shot on NASA TV showing a beautiful moonlit night in the Gulf of Mexico. So I guess it's time for kind of wrap-up thoughts for this week. Um, let's, let's start with you, Tim. Where are we and where are we, where are we going to be in a week's time? Well, I think that the my take on it is what we're seeing in on NASA TV, what we're seeing on the Internet from various uh, cameras and shots and uh, imaging on Mars is almost led by the questions which we're establishing here. In other words, we saw a video of the helicopter taking off and people say, no, look, there's no dust. And then the next thing is the video is an enhanced video released with dust. So I think that, you know, what they are doing, wasn't proving it that through our evolution process they're getting come to terms with the actual atmosphere that is on Mars as opposed to the one they believe was there. But equally I believe that they're looking to mould the media to satisfy the level of curiosity of people here who basically, in my opinion, sorry to be cynical, swab us off so they can just get on with the full mission which is to go and check for archaeology as opposed to, you know, uh, do very sort of okay. you know, two plus two Sorry to interrupt. Spacecraft, spacecraft just splashed down. There's a gorgeous color view. The boats with the searchlights. Uh, when you guys can see all this uh, on the recording, it's gorgeous. Absolutely gorgeous. Um, okay, we got about uh, two minutes. Ruggiero on Mars or anything. Uh, yeah, let's compare natural features of uh, geology on Earth. To Mars, it seems like Mars is able to spontaneously create uh, alignment of uh, natural geological features. So that's <laughs> what I think we should take it next. Okay, Andrew, you're up. 
Yeah. Well, Richard, if this is a religion and we're the great unwashed, not allowed to be part of it, there's going to come a time when they have to open the doors to the church and we're all going to be part of it going forward or we're never going to advance. So, Well, I have a feeling we're very, very close. I mean, really close. Because by changing the ingenuity profile, making her an adjunct to the mission, they have crossed a boundary they cannot go back across. Because with those capabilities and that colored camera, we'll know a lot when we uh, see the next colored images to see if the kind of noise has magically disappeared in preparation for her real mission. Hey, I want to thank everyone you know, for participating in today's kind of disjointed show. I want to wish Ron to get much better soon. He'll be back with us hopefully next week, and we will have surprises for you. And again, the man of the hour just landed successfully a spacecraft in the Gulf of Mexico, and he's the one that's going to take us to the moon and on to Mars. And I think... You can probably take that to the bank. So until tomorrow night, same time, same bad channel. Remember, third star on the left, straight on till morning. Good night, everyone.